Welcome back to Decouple. <laughs> Today I'm joined by Emmett Penny, the one and only nuclear barbarian. Uh, for a long-awaited episode, um, it has been, I think it might have been like a year since we last talked, Emmett. And um, that is too long. Like that, yeah. Too long in my books. And really, I just wanted to catch up with you. You've been writing some fantastic pieces. You're writing a book right now. Um, I've been thinking a lot about a lot of different things as well. So I thought we would just kind of riff this, improv it, and see where it takes us. Kind of, kind of exciting, actually, not to have like a direction that I'm that I'm uh, aware of. So Emmett, welcome back to yeah. Decouple. Let's see if we keep this actual recording after we do it, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For those uh, listening and not watching, Emmett just took a drink out of, I think, the largest uh, beverage container I've, I've ever seen. Um, Stay anyway. hydrated. Stay All right. hydrated. All right. You don't trust your kidneys, eh? I'm just kidding. Yeah, it's a medical right. joke. All right, Emmett, what's up? What's new? What's exciting? Dude, uh, I mean, well, first of all, uh, you're you're conquering in Canada, so that's what's up. Um, you're doing like a, me, a million appearances and stuff like that. Um, what's new on my end? Uh, dude, I've just been – well, Robert's documentary came out and I'm in yeah. it. And I'm in it way more than I thought I was going to be in it. Um and uh, I've just been writing, like you said, working on a book. I'm writing a history of the American electrical grid. And every day I sit down to write, I'm filled with dread at the task before me. And I try to overcome that. Um, grid Brief just launched some premium products. So I'm doing that as well. It's a busy time, man. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, I mean, definitely sign up for Grid Brief. It's amazing. Uh, go premium. And uh, yeah, Robert <laughs> Bryce's uh, documentary, I'm ashamed to say, you know, just with everything being going crazy with Pickering and, you know, I've written five op-eds uh, in the last week, four out of the five have been published. Um, one of them we're, uh, we're shooting to get into an American uh, press, maybe the Wall Street Journal. Anyway, so maybe we'll hit five out of five. It's kept me way too busy. Uh, so I've not been able to watch the whole feature, just uh, the episode I was kind of featured in. Um, but yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. Let's let's big that up for just a second for the decouple listeners that haven't uh, that haven't watched it yet. What's what's uh, what's the series about, Emmett? If you want to sum it up, yeah, yeah. So it's called Juice Power Politics and the Grid. Um, I, Maddie and I recorded right after each other uh, for it in Chicago. Um, I think God. I, it, a year ago or something like that. So it's been a long time in the making him and Tyson Culver. I interviewed Tyson when it came out for nuclear barbarians. They basically wanted to take all the lessons that they'd learned from doing power hungry. And after they had released their first documentary together, uh, juice, how electricity explains the world and to talk about what's happening to the U.S. electrical grid. So a lot of familiar faces are in there. It's me, there's Maddie Hilly, there's you, there's Mark Nelson, um, there's Meredith Angwin, and a whole bunch of other people. And it covers the grid from a bunch of different angles. I think my favorite story in the entire thing, and this is probably the fan favorite overall, is the Osage tribes victory over the energy company that illegally installed 84 wind turbines on their land to which they own the mineral rights. And they just won their case against, I think, Enel. It's an Italian company, I believe, if I remember rightly. And so now Enel has to rip out all 84 and that's on 8,400 acres of land. And the tribe has yet to even begin its suit for damages. So... Yeah, and that that is already a like three hundred million dollar expense for NL just to rip those out. So there's a lot of stuff in there about what's going wrong with the grid, and it ends. Uh, I was surprised to find out with a rumination on my idea of nuclear power plants as industrial cathedrals, and so there's a lot of me talking towards the end of it. But that's the general gist of it. You know, people who listen to Decouple will be familiar with the reliability concerns that a renewables heavy energy policy has brought the American grid to and what we can do to fix that. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really interesting, the Osage issue. I remember there was also, um, I think Greta was in solidarity with a Sami tribe in either Norway or Sweden that were protesting a wind development on their, yes. their lands, which would have impacted caribou migrations. And, you know, I guess we live in this era of identity politics uh, and, and a certain amount of tokenism. But 
Um, you know, when indigenous people aren't convenient to the uh, green tech bros, I think that's an uh, uh, interesting, interesting moment. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure if, if you've been following how that, uh, that issue has been followed um, amongst the Osage. Uh, I imagine there's some people saying, hey, man, I mean, we got to save the climate, so they should just leave it off. Uh, like, have you followed reaction to that or, or has it just been not been reported? I, I know um, a lot of it just hasn't been efforts. reported. Yeah, I don't really know who else has covered it. Which isn't to say that they haven't, um, but you know, I uh, I don't read every single thing, so maybe there has been some big coverage, but I'm surprised that uh, there it hasn't been bigger. I mean, it's like you know, it's as you said, it's a very inconvenient narrative for just about anybody who covers energy because energy is almost exclusively covered in the mainstream press through the prism of climate and environmentalism. All right. Well, certainly, you know, ringing endorsement there for uh, for this new piece. Um, it's it's. I remember talking to Robert as it's been developed. Um, one of the one of the uh, working titles in the past, I think, had been brand renewable. Another had been like the Enronification of the grid. Those may have become sort of subtitle uh, because this is a docu series being released in in twenty minute chunks. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've I've really got to join some of my listeners who have not watched it yet and and grind through the uh, through the whole series. Um, <clears throat> Emmett, I mean, we could talk about a lot of different things. Um, I've certainly been on a bit of a journey. I tend to go through these kind of ebbs and flows of, of productivity and of optimism and pessimism. Um, you know, I, I, I my listenership will be tired with, with this story, but just the, the Doomberg, uh, clinical diagnosis of being a defensive pessimist, um, which very much fits my sort of Eastern European um, genetics just getting rolled over and over again by, you know, our neighbors or the Mongols or whoever else. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, expecting everything to go to shit and then being pleasantly surprised when it doesn't, that's kind of how, how the psychology works. Um, but you know, you're thinking a lot about the grid right now. You're thinking about nuclear as well. Um, you know, in Ontario, we've had this great victory, um, with the Pickering refurbishment. Um, but when I kind of step back and look at it, um, we are just holding the line here in Ontario, you know, due to this accident of geology and not having gas and coal, Ontario went nuclear. It was a completely an energy security play in the 1970s. Price of coal went up after OPEC. The lakes would freeze from time to time. You know, coal worker unions in the States were were pretty rowdy and uh, we would have uh, supply security issues just to you know keep our auto manufacturing plants humming with all the electricity they needed. And so we went nuclear for a, a legitimate energy security reason. And uh, yeah, anyway, we built this incredible infrastructure and now we are maintaining it. Um, we're doing a kick-ass job. We're running nuclear mega projects, you know, ahead of schedule and, and on or under budget. Um, but we are treading water here, man. We're going to add these four SMRs, hopefully by the mid 2030s. And that will get us back to where we are now because we're not refurbishing all of the six reactors at Pickering, just four. So, you know, I, I find myself um, reflecting back to the number of years I've been in this um, and certainly these are heady days compared to 2018. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I am not ready to do victory dances or join the industry in the kind of euphoria that I'm, that I'm seeing in, in some areas where people are thinking, Hey, you know, we've got the social political license now. Let's just, let's just bang this stuff out and it's going to be easy. Um, I'm not sure kind of where you're at in terms of your, your thoughts about nuclear in the grid right now, but I'd, I'd love to hear you weigh in. Man, I hope people in the industry don't think that they have the social and political license to do what they want, at least in the United States, because they certainly don't. I mean, things have improved. That's unambiguous. I just took another huge sip. Sorry, guys. I am thirsty. Um, I'm parched. But look, I mean, we're a long way away from where we want to be. It's clear that our side is gaining ground. I mean, uh, I want to give Breakthrough Institute their flowers for basically making sure that that anti-nuke dude didn't get re-upped for the NRC, you know? So it seems like we have a little more juice politically than we used to. It is true that the pro-nuclear side has more social license. Um, and I think that's going to increase as it becomes clear that renewables can't do it on their own. But you don't want to take anything for granted. You know, I mean, that's one thing that I've learned. Two things can always happen. You can always just uh, postpone your targets for all sorts of things and build more fossil fuels, uh, or you can just get poorer. You know, like you can do that too. If you're wealthy, you can just be like, well, we'll just get poorer 
Yeah. You know, go to, go to, <laughs> that's, go to Germany that's always for some an option. front row seats. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. Some, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So something I'm, I'm like reflecting on and hearing a lot right now, and, and I'll call it sort of like the hubris of the present. You know, we look back and we say, hey, you know, if our parents and grandparents could do that in the 70s with their slide rules, man, we got this. You know, we've got AI now. Like we, you know, we've got the computing power of the Apollo program and like an iPhone 4. Um, no problem, right? And, you know, again, I think back to the great nuclear build out in Ontario when we commissioned 22, uh, sorry, 20 reactors in, in 22 years. The, the scale at which that was occurring, um, what an industrial heartland Ontario was at that time, massive steel mills, huge automotive sector, and a um, you know, vertically integrated utility called Ontario Hydro that did it all and was actually you know, jokingly referred to as a construction company that makes electricity uh, because we banged out these massive you know, eight boiler unit coal plants. Like That's what we were building before we went nuclear. And then you know, we finally decided to kick the coal habit and didn't build a single large coal uh, station after we, we built Pickering, uh, but they shifted over. And I mean, there was just an, a massive amount of industrial inertia of, you know, human resources that had been built up through that initial public power program uh, since the 50s and 60s. And I look at the state of things now, you know, the learn to code generation, the, um, you know, the uh, gray hairs and the skilled trades, which, you know, have been rejuvenated because of our refurbishments, but like, we are nowhere near being in the position that we were. And what we critically need are the human beings who can, you know, swing the hammers, who can form the concrete, who can lay the rebar, um, you know, who can fit the pipes, et cetera. And I, I don't think we're anywhere near as good a position as we were in, in the 70s and 80s right now. So I'll call it the hubris of the present. Um, that's my little reflection from, you know, the utopia, the, the nuclear utopia of Ontario here where, you know, I think the West is looking really for inspiration, you know, as, as the, the first grid scale SMRs are, are, you know, at least they're scraping some topsoil away to start planning for them. But, uh, you know, you're writing a book on the grid, you're, you're deep diving some history here. I wonder if you have similar reflections or, or anecdotes to add on to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think you're absolutely right that there is a human capital component to this uh, that is undeniable. And, and that's at least... One thing we can say, that's a fixable problem. So that's one of the problems that we might want to have going through this. Uh, how it gets fixed remains to be seen. I mean, I would hate in uh, America if fixing this human capital problem turns into a greater proliferation of the importance of higher education. And I think job training and other non-college ways to get people into these trades and professions is far preferable to what is clearly, and this is not uh, anything to do actually with like the quote unquote woke politics of the university, but with what seems to be a university system that's decaying as a part of its own incentives, financial and otherwise. Uh, I, all, I would like people to walk into these jobs without being saddled with all sorts of debt or without having to have the taxpayer necessarily foot the bill for their education because I don't think that's needed. I think, you know, uh, certainly for some higher level engineering jobs, that's just probably going to be needed, but not for everything, you know. Um, I'm going to plead humility on the rest of the shape of that in terms of specifics. Uh, that's just how I'm taking a look at that. You know, and then I think, how we view tech has and and industry has changed a lot since you know the 1890s or something like that people had been convinced for a very long time that you know uh, smog big brick buildings and steam towers were the hallmarks of progress and then that really changed in the 50s, 60s, and then especially the 70s. And now we have a much more fraught relationship with our own industrial might. And that has been codified in the law in America. So obviously, there needs to be some regulatory overhaul and, frankly, some sort of cultural work done on figuring out how to have a different narrative about our Promethean abilities as human beings, you know, it's clear that there is no environmental story of humanity that moves beyond the realm of mere survival. Survival as the horizon 
of society does not inspire, it demoralizes, atomizes, and is injurious to the type of projects that we want to embark upon because they require longer time horizons. Yeah, I mean, two things to kind of riff off of what you said. Um, you know, you said the, the human capital issue is is solvable, and I, I do believe it is, although, you know, we do have different demography, uh, maybe less so in the U.S., uh, but certainly we see that internationally in, in a number of European countries and in Asia and Japan and Korea. And, you know, hopefully the Japanese get back on the, the wagon with nuclear. But when I was chatting with some uh, Japanese utility experts over there and asking them what the number one constraint was on on getting the nukes back online, um, and for that industry to, to get back on its feet. And they said, you know, it's demographics. Like, you know, they've got a replacement rate of, I don't know, 1.2, 1.3. And they've had an industry shut down for 16 years. Uh, you know, things are things are not looking good. Um, so, so I think it's solvable, but it's going to take significant uh, policy investments. And, you know, this whole kind of social mobility of nuclear, as you're saying, there's some things that need to stay within the academy in terms of certain engineering uh, educations. But, you know, a friend of mine um, who's now the CEO of Can Do Energy Inc. started off in, I think, food and beverage management was his uh, early training. And he's worked for Ontario Power Generation uh, before that, you know, the big vertically integrated monolith, Ontario Hydro, for his most of his career. Um, you know, they sent him back to school to get an accounting degree. Um, he ended up, you know, being a big part of running our Darlington refurbishments successfully. Uh, and is now, yeah, the CEO of Can Do Energy Inc. And I mean, those kind of social mobility stories, you hear a lot of them in this sector. Um, you know, on the one hand, you hear, OK, you know, you can work at a nuclear plant with just a high school education. And I'm sure some aunties go, oh, man, OK, that sounds like Homer Simpson at the controls. Um, but no, I mean, this is. a sector. Yeah, great. Let's do that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. More Homer Simpsons, please. <laughs> Thank you. I, I double down on that. Absolutely. That's what I want. Do I want average Joe's to be able to support, you know, a family and own their own home on a high school education and operate technology that has the best safety record in the world? Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. That's the America I want. Oh man, brother. Oh man. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I, I think that there's, there's the, always this classism right around that. Like, do you really want a bunch of guys without degrees? You know, I am uh, approaching early old age, uh, so I now listen to interviews on C-SPAN uh, because they do a lot of interviews with historians and stuff like that. And they were having a conversation about um, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who was a legal scholar and then eventually Supreme Court justice, who fought in the Civil War. And some guy called in, and I could tell immediately that this dude was working class just based on his dialect. And he asked this long, sophisticated question about a particular Supreme Court decision. And the interviewer said, are you a lawyer? And he said, no, I'm a mechanic. You know what I mean? So like, I don't really have time for that sort of, you know, like, oh my God, are you telling me somebody without a law degree or who doesn't write white papers for a living might actually be in charge of something? Oh God. Oh no. They don't subscribe to the New York times. How can we trust them? Right. Right. Where's the Ivy league stamp? Yeah. I mean, and what I was referring to there yeah. is, is that are you telling me that they didn't, their favorite show wasn't white Lotus. <laughs> How could this person ever run anything important in this country? Yeah. No. And what I was referring to, to be clear was you can enter as a high school student and then get on the job training that takes you up to just extraordinary levels of, of competence. And you know, I, I've had the opportunity now to meet a number of uh, reactor operators, senior reactor operators, shift supervisors, and the kind of vigor that goes into that training. You know, I, I have some insight into it as a medical professional. Um, I have some inkling of what it takes to become a pilot and maintain a pilot's license. And, you know, maintaining your, your reactor operator license is wild. Um, what they put you through, you know, needing to have memorized every valve and pump in your station and, uh, you know, have that blueprint imprinted in your mind. It's It's pretty extraordinary. So... Definitely, definitely a, a, a good thing. And I'm, I'm just like so grateful for the vantage point that I've gotten here in Ontario, where we have a vibrant sector, you know, meeting people within the, the, the nuclear industry itself from the shop floor right on up to the top, um, you know, sitting in uh, meetings with politicians, um, labor unions, just really getting a sense of, of how the political sausage made is made, how the electrons are, I won't say made, but jiggled. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a really important education. Um, I wanted to like shift gears a little bit and it's just cause I've been sort of like, you know, tugging on some threads of some different ideas and wanting to bounce them off of uh, some of my com compadres. Um, 
Where I mean, and, and, and the sort of initial uh, thoughts that I shared in terms of the little bit of cynicism and pessimism. I mean, where where are you at right now in terms of how you're seeing the world through the lens that you're looking at the grid, electricity, energy, power? Um, where, where are you sitting in terms of optimism, pessimism? How do you frame it? I mean, America's headed for a reliability crisis. That's just the consensus. You know, consensus consensus can be wrong. You know that that happens. Happened with the housing market. Um, But it seems like we're sort of, not sort of, we are getting unambiguous signals from both both the North American Electricity Reliability Corp, which is our shared watchdog for reliability, um, and then the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, that this is happening. And now we're starting to get signals from the markets, including PJM, the largest power market in the country, and I think the largest one in the world, that they are starting to lose base load power too. I mean, so is MISO, their neighbor. And this is the dynamic. So it's pretty hard to feel like things are going great when you're watching that unfold. I think the real task is to not become a doomer or a Cassandra about it to not be hysterical. I think I've seen enough of that in my lifetime. The politics of fear is so poisonous and frankly, so tired at this point that I can't participate in that anymore. So how do we talk about a serious issue without it becoming this hysterical, uh, you know, we're all going to die if we don't get this right type of thing? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think what I really want and what I focus on now is cultivating within myself is a sense of sobriety and an attempt at prudence when looking at these things. You, you know, do and sound that like requires a certain level of epistemic humility. It does sound like you're heading into your, or you're calling it early old age. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, because uh, this is a really complex system. There are a lot of different uh, elements at play, a lot of different interests. No one's ever going to get what they really want. I think that's another thing that's really important here. Um, I would be shocked if America actually achieved a mostly nuclear grid in the next three generations. Probably not going to happen. You know, regarding you know, but yeah. regarding their reliability. But you know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, so that's to say, I'm not doing like pessimism. I'm also not doing optimism. What I will say is that I prefer what actually exists to what someone's trying to tell me the future could be most of the time. Talking about the reliability crisis, I had a very interesting conversation with an upcoming decouple guest, uh, David March of Exergy Energy. Um, And his his firm uh, really consults with and I believe provides reliability services for you know, mission critical industries like hospitals, for instance, that can't afford to go offline. So, you know, big diesel backup generators and what he's hearing from a lot of his customers, and he'll tell the story better than me very soon uh, in a couple of weeks, um, is, you know, what is what is registered as a blackout depends on the utility, but often it's several minutes. And you have a lot of, you know, really important industrial um, processes, for instance, that can't tolerate, you know, a few microseconds, let alone a few seconds of interruption and all the machines have to be turned off and retooled and we're talking about major losses. So um, you're sort of putting your finger on the pulse of the grid right now and in, in all the research you're doing for this book. Can you comment a bit more on the early warning signs that we're seeing? Because right now, I mean, the the blackouts that the majority of the public, you know, are familiar with are, you know, tree falls online, power out for a few hours, power back on. Um, so tell me about some of the warning signs that uh, we should be paying attention to. Right. So... S- This is what's difficult right now is that people remember back to Meredith Angwin's fatal trifecta, which is an over-reliance on uh, natural gas, an over-commitment to intermittent renewables, and then an over-dependence on imports for neighbors. Right now, most of the neighbors in America have enough baseload to where they can import and export to each other. But that is slowly disappearing as we lose coal. And the Environmental uh, Protection Agency is trying to ratchet up its methane and like soot rules or whatever around coal and natural gas to really put the squeeze on them to get basically more of them turned into being 
uneconomic. That's part of their plan. And the utilities and the markets are like, please don't do this. This is horrific. But this is sort of where we're going. And you can start to see it in very seldom publicly covered or explained stories. So there's the Brandon Shores plant in Maryland, which powers a lot of Baltimore. That's in the PJM footprint in America. Talon Energy owns that coal plant. PJM is trying to find a way to keep that coal plant online, and Talon doesn't really want to, in part because Talon reached a private deal with the Sierra Club that they would shut down that plant. This is like the second or third time the Sierra Club has said, we will basically bury you in lawsuits forever until you shut down this fossil fuel infrastructure. So there's nothing really PJM can do about that. And Talon's been clear about that. They were like, look, we'd participate in your capacity markets or whatever if we could, but the soot regulations or whatever the emission regulations on this means that we can't actually run this plant enough, even in the capacity markets, even, you know, as I guess reliability must run because we can only emit so much before we actually have to shut down. So it's just not worth our time and capital to keep this at this point. And, you know, that's a your problem, not a my problem. That's a YP, not an MP. And, you know, then you start to wonder, well, how many other times has the Sierra Club or whoever done this? And how many more times will they do it now that Michael Bloomberg has dumped half a billion dollars into these organizations? You know, so what does this start to look like? We can get a pretty good idea when we take a look at the winter storms that have happened in America. So winter storm Elliot, which took place over the winter of 2023, 2024, uh, that time period happened right around Christmas. If people remember the gas system in New York almost lost pressure, which would have required, you know, evacuating a couple hundred thousand people from New York city in the dead of winter and sub zero temperatures. And then you have to go into every single one of their apartments and buildings or whatever, and turn off all the gas lines and then fix the problem with the pressure in the pipe system and then send all of these guys back out to turn them back on. So this is a several week process in the heart of one of the world's biggest, wealthiest metropolises. And one of the things I've pointed out is that if that did happen or if it does happen, people are going to say, well, this is why we need to electrify everything and then shift the burden onto the already overly gas reliant and overtaxed electricity system that has some of the same problems. So you're getting rid of one redundancy that might have some governance or technical problems that need to be solved to basically put all of your chips onto a grid in New York that is already getting strained. Zone J, that's New York City, is having to pay offshore, you know, basically these floating barges of peaker plants to stay online because of what happened after they lost Indian Point. This is a problem that's only going to accelerate, you know, as, as it goes. And as you've seen, as you've reported, I think not just in Ontario, but other parts of Canada, electricity demand is slowly starting to increase. And that is going to, I think, is forecasted to be pretty robust over the next few years. Do the markets that import from Quebec Hydro expect that to continue to be a good deal when Canada has its own problems of demand increases and it needs that hydro for itself. Now, I'm sure you could always find a deal with Quebec where they're willing to sell. It just might not be what you're willing to pay. Yeah, I wouldn't be so sure about that because, uh, you know, part of the wildfire stories where smoke uh, from northern Quebec, uh, you know, turned uh, New York into a, uh, you know, apocalypse Mad Max scene uh, with all the soot and the kind of orange air uh, that was so poignantly captured in those photos was drought and uh, their water levels are actually quite low. And so um, usually they export a lot uh, during the summer. It's a time of surplus. Their peak demand is in the winter. They got to stay warm and they, they put water through turbines to, to heat their province. Um, and so they were actually importing from us. They've been importing from us much more than usual because ultimately uh, I guess it's the iron law, Robert and, and uh, Pilkey Jr. Um, you know, they're going to stay, they're going to keep themselves warm in the winter. And so they had to hold a lot of water back oh, yeah. just because the rain wasn't there. And, and we're seeing increasingly hydroelectricity is, is intermittent um, on a different time scale than wind and solar, but you know, climactically, it's not a surprise. We saw that in California 
um, last decade where mm-hmm. hydro production Colorado dropped too. 50%. Yeah. Um, and that, that's what is being leaned upon. It's always, you know, my neighbor can can sort of fill in for me. I, I got a question, I guess, about... Great. So it's even worse than I thought. <laughs> it's terrible. No, honestly, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's why Quebec is actually looking at uh, refurbishing uh, their can-do nuclear reactor in the province. Um, you know, there's a, a big issue in terms of public perception of nuclear in Quebec. We'll see if uh, if the pain is enough to uh, to make them head in what I think is a very sensible direction. But, you know, when I look south of the border, like, you know, we're not Ontario Hydro anymore. We're not a big vertically integrated utility up here. Uh, but there's still, um, you know, we have Ontario Power Generation, which uh, basically owns almost all of the uh, uh, jet publicly owned generating assets. It's got a single shareholder, the province of Ontario, which is you know supposed to represent um, its uh, its voter base. It's a lot simpler in terms of kind of incentives that are there, the patronage relationships, et cetera. When I look south of the border and I think a little bit about like the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and I don't mean to be uh, you know too uh, hysterical in, in making comparisons, but I just see the institutions, the ecosystem of those institutions are starting to really uh, become super messy in terms of, again, you know, the, the competing interests, the competing fiduciary duties, it just seems so goddamn inefficient. And, you know, you're, you're kind of a cultural, political historian. Like, how did we get to the places that we're at now? And Meredith Angwin, I think, talked about this a lot in her book, Shorting the Grid. But um, the clusterfuckery of it all, um, you know, when I look south of the border, I just go, this, this is a hot mess. And again, I'm not saying that we're in a, we're in a utopia here in Ontario. We're, we're holding the line. We're treading water, maintaining our nuclear fleet. Um, so tell me a bit more, uh, you know, I've got an inkling. I'd, I'd like to hear uh, your analysis of, of, of that phenomenon. Yeah. So you're asking basically why are American institutions, institutions both decadent and ossified, uh, right now? Decaying perhaps or that, dysfunctional, or? like yeah. unable to plan properly for projected needs. Like for instance, I've heard PGM is shutting down about 40 gigawatts of, you know, dispatchable fossils, uh, within the next decade. Um, you know, the New England's pipeline constrained, um, you know, heavily gas dependent, but won't build the pipelines, b- despite sitting next to the Marcellus shales, which maybe are starting to flatten. <laughs> we'll see what happens there in terms of their production. Um, and we have things like uh, gigawatt scale um, server farms coming online, um, you know, and AI assisted Google searches take 10 to 20 times more energy. Currently, I think internet and computers use about 15 to 20% of, of grid electricity. Like, we are on a, a collision course. And I mean, that's aside from, you know, the these are pragmatic concerns. Although, I mean, I think most of this AI energy is probably going to go towards just making really exciting porn for teenagers wearing their Apple goggles. Um, but, you know, like we're also talking aspirationally about electrifying everything and heat pumps and EVs and whatnot. So, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's a big question. It's way too fucking broad. But, you know, why, why, why is there such organizational institutional dysfunction in terms of, again, that kind of ecosystem of government, utility, you know, Sierra clubs, whatever the big mess. Yeah. So, I mean, there, 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 yeah. So there's a lot of different explanations we can have. We let's talk about NGOs for a little bit, for a little bit. America um, has always leaned on its civil society, which means these groups that are both sort of, a little bit outside of the market, a little bit outside of the political realm, church groups, things like that, to hold itself together. For a long time, these were membership organizations. Uh, I mean, basically from the 19th century up until about the 70s, that was true, right? This was what Tocqueville noticed as sort of the genius of American democratic self organization when he was here during, I think, the Jackson administration. So about the 1830s. And You can see that happen when you look at any press coverage, contemporaneous press coverage of presidential elections in the early 20th century in America. It's like, you know, President Hoover meets with the New York, you know, uh, Jewish Women's League, which is, you know, like, I mean, how many people could that possibly be at that time? And he, but he needs them in order to convince them to talk to the rest of the community to whip up their votes. And these are things that, you know, these groups have their own songs, they have their own rituals, all of these things, and they hold them together you know, for a variety of reasons, including urban exit into the suburbs and things like that. Uh, the loss of things like unions, which had were pretty tightly correlated with 
civil society organizations at the membership level and secularization, which means people don't go to church as much, and the rise of these litigious NGO organizations, especially things like the environmental movement, we saw this go from membership organizations to donor-oriented NGOs that figured out that they could get the sweet, sweet tax benefits of being a nonprofit organization. So these became things that were less responsive to any of their members and beholden mostly to their donors and had their own agenda to push. When we take a look at energy and how that's played out, one of the things that I've started to realize is that these NGOs and universities and then state bureaucracies themselves have created an ecosystem where it creates self-sustaining paradigms of values and the enforcement of those values. So let's just take a brief example to talk about what I mean. This is not an endorsement of Trump or the Trump administration. One of the things people noticed is that the a lot of the offices or whatever that Trump could have staffed, he did not. And they were, I thought at the time that was just because they were basically incompetent, didn't know what they were doing. But now I realize what really happened is that there just aren't that enough Republicans to do that. There aren't enough people that have a different set of values than the establishment that runs these things to even staff these organizations. So what does that tell you? It means that there is a substantial level of groupthink about how energy gets handled in America. This is sort of my hypothesis. I might be wrong. Again, I'm willing to plead humility, but this is sort of what I'm seeing. Now, that doesn't mean that we're living in this like communist order where it's like, you know, top down from the state, we enforce these things. It is something a little bit more diffuse and ambient uh, that's like a sociological dimension to what has happened to American institutions. Now, one of the things that the people in this managerial class mostly have in common is that they're very worried about climate change and they view energy strictly through the lens of climate change. Everything is about that. I think decoupled a couple listeners are well aware that that does not always breed the best energy literacy. I also think that the utilities or whatever that the fossil fuel industry, whatever we want to say, simply thought that because they were necessary, they would be treated as necessary and got their fiefdoms, their, their holds in these era, in these bureaucracies, in these patronage networks or whatever, eaten away out from under them. So now we're in a really tight spot where there is incredible consensus in a lot of powerful unelected bodies, both in and out of government, that have a vested interest in pursuing these goals. They have the lion's share of the human capital to do so. And there are no proper feedback mechanisms in the press or otherwise to tell them that what they're doing might have some drawbacks that are very painful and maybe they might want to think about it. That is part of how we got here. It's not the whole story, but it's some of the story. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a, a vital element. Uh, you know, here in Ontario, um, the government commissioned a report called Pathways to Decarbonization. Uh, it was commissioned due to um, the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, which is our sort of premier anti-nuclear group, uh, which fought hard for our coal phase out to be a coal to gas phase out. Um, they subsequently uh, decided that gas was no longer a transition or bridge fuel, but it was bad. Um, that was about you know ten or fifteen years late um, in terms of uh, you know being consistent on on, on climate and clean air. Um, and uh, they they have been pushing now uh, for a gas phase up, thinking that it's just as simple as as coal was. Um, you know, nuclear you know supplies those those or replaces those coal services quite well gas as we know it's it's really hard to get that last bit of gas off of a grid it gets very very expensive it has a very important function in terms of uh, peaking um and as as a capacity tool um in any case they uh convinced 40 odd municipalities to um you know put forward statements calling for a gas phase so the government had to respond they issued this report um, which is basically looking at how could ontario phase gas completely off the grid and, you know, it, it came up with some really bizarre stuff. I mean, on the on the one side, 
you know, the nuclear folks are happy because it said we need about 18 gigawatts of new nuclear. This was also, I think, moving towards, you know, net zero push uh, to explain that that amount of generation that was required, but also 16 gigawatts of hydrogen. And, you know, I think um, one of the very interesting phenomena here when people talk about, you know, wind and solar, yeah, they'll work. We just need storage to back it up. They have storage currently. And that, those are huge, I believe, salt caverns where we store, you know, seasonally massive amounts of natural gas, like uh, thinking about Europe here, but all over the world. That's part of the natural gas network. It's, it's the plants themselves, but it's also the pipelines and these huge, huge storage, uh, geologic storage facilities. And, you know, the question is, are batteries and hydrogen like gas? Are they as good as gas? Can, you know, are they as energy dense as gas? Can, can we produce them in the same kind of volumes as gas? Um, but in any case, the, the, the source of this question, which is rambling, is, um, you know, you had the independent electric systems operator, which are, you know, quite competent people um, playing fantasy games with 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 planning our grid around like yeah 16 gigawatts of gas are just of hydrogen are just gonna sort of appear and contribute to the mix um i cannot imagine um that kind of um irresponsible fantasy land thinking occurring in the 70s and 80s you'd be laughed off uh you know off your chair um but it's it's the climate um concern which is pushing it because you have to sort of force all the models to fit you know what is the consensus getting to net zero by 2050 and and you know practicality and the truth be damned we're going to make it happen and we can model it so there it is i don't know that's that seems to be part of the dysfunction it's north of the border but it seems to be uh, quite strong south of the border as well yeah i mean in the 70s and 80s these these managers these utility people had their own fantasy land ideas and it was that they could just continue to keep growth going forever and that would conform with the incentives of the monopoly utility system as it had for almost 100 years by that point. So they had a good reason to believe that it would do that. But, you know, reality has a nasty way of sh pulling the rug out from under you. So, you know, I think what we're realizing is that, uh, you know, everything works, nothing works forever. That's, you know, it, all of this like green stuff, like, quote unquote, works right? Uh, up until a certain point, whether you have to get that last bit of gas off the grid or again, to cite for the umpteenth time, the German example, soon to be followed by Spain, by the way, uh, Spain is now embarking upon almost the exact same energy policy as Germany, including its nuclear phase out. It's a little sunnier it's there though. It's for, a little sunnier there. We have like 9% capacity yeah. factors of 60 gigawatts of German solar, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll say this, uh, you know, I think that the Spanish current energy trajectory will be incredibly good for French nuclear and American and Qatari LNG, right? So they will become very reliant on their neighbors very soon if they pull that off. There are some nuclear activists in Spain who are going to fight this tooth and nail. Hopefully you and I can talk to some of them and uh, help them garner some more support for that. So. I think, you know, one of the tales that I don't want to tell is that we used to lie to ourselves less often than we do now. I don't think that's true. I think humans lie to themselves about the same rate every single point in history. Sometimes those stories are actually very effective and line up with the way things are, and then problems happen when they don't. Right now, we're running into a situation where they don't. I will say that the results of the previous paradigm were pretty undeniable in their improvements of everyday life for people and an increase in wealth. So they do have that in their favor compared to what we have going on now, which even if uh, I'm making this claim about like we lie to ourselves all the time, there is like something pretty especially weird about what's happening now. It is wild that the dominant paradigm for how we understand the most fundamental input in industrial society, energy, has been apocalyptic for over half a century. That's crazy. And it's been around for a long time. I like spending time on YouTube going through random like quotidian archival footage people shot. So sometimes this will be like 
you know, uh, just a bunch of dudes like fixing a roof or something like that. And somebody's like uploaded it onto YouTube for some reason. And I don't know why, but I'll watch it. Cause it's like interesting to see, you know, how people behave before cameras were ubiquitous as a historian. I find it intriguing to see these slices of life. I was watching today a high school yearbook video from Sugarland, Texas in 1993 while I was drinking my coffee. And it has its own little section about how important solving climate change is in there, right? So we've been doing this for a while. <laughs> um, so it's going to take a while to get out of this mode of this is the only way to think about energy and what we're going to do. I've, I've watched one of those videos recently, and what you notice is none of the kids are doing this. <laughs> now they don't have their phones in their faces. And yeah, no phones, right? That's really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, we're uh, in that early old age stage where we uh, we remember fondly uh, our, our youth being a bit different than our, our current reality. Um, you know, part of uh, to circle back a, l- a little bit to uh, Tyson Culver, uh, who, who you had in your podcast, and, and Robert Bryce's uh, new piece. I mean, it's it's um, pretty gung ho on on nuclear. Um, you know, as an antidote to what's what's happening to our grids, happening to reliability, and you know, a nod to like, yes, let's try and do things that will avert the worst of climate change or let's do things that are that are good for working people or will help uh you know diminish air pollution um in terms of the prospects in the u.s right now i've I've sort of shared a bit of what's happening in canada um you know that there seems like there was this nuclear renaissance of 2005 henry hub was hitting like 15 dollars per million btus um you know fracking hadn't happened yet fukushima hadn't happened yet um, you know, even with Fukushima, I would I would make the contention that if the fracking revolution had not occurred and you still had those eye watering natural gas uh, prices, if these LNG export terminals were in fact LNG import terminals, as was starting uh, to to happen in the uh, the noughties or the early two thousands, um, you know, we would have muscled through Vogel and summer and got better at building AP one thousands, and there'd be seventeen to twenty under construction right now. Um, obviously, that didn't happen, um, and. Natural gas is still cheap, although it does seem like there's some evidence from, you know, Gehring and Rosen's fog and Art Behrman and others saying that some shale fields are starting to look like, uh, like a little like Hubbard's curve, um, and and might be showing some peaking. Um, in terms of the prospects for nuclear uh, in the U.S., um, what what are your thoughts right now, analyzing this and thinking about it in terms of grid reliability? I mean, obviously, it's necessary. We need something that can do what coal does without the bad parts of coal and we're losing coal without nuclear. So we're going to be put in a painful vice pretty soon. That's already underway, as we've already talked about. I think everybody expects gas prices to get higher, natural gas prices in America. Whether those expectations are true or not, you know, will remain to be seen. But, you know, when you had uh, Jigger Shaw on here, he did mention very helpfully that the American Gas Association thinks that the days of 2 to $3, you know, MMBTU natural gas are going to come to an end. You know, it'll be something more like 4 or 5 And for a system that is 40% dependent on natural gas, it may be increase, may increase that amount by the time we hit those numbers. I mean, you know, electricity is very sensitive to natural gas prices. So, yeah, there might be a new case for building more nuclear, especially as uh, we see all of this demand for compute, you know. But again, it's going to depend on how we can get these markets and also people and these huge uh, NGOs on board with this so that they're not in the way. There's some helpful signs that there is a bipartisan way forward. I just wrote a piece for Grid Reef Premium on Connecticut, which has a surprising amount of agreement between Republicans and Democrats and the Department of Environment and Energy Policy, DEEP, uh, which is their sort of state body that takes a look at this stuff, about the need for nuclear. And they seem to be open to perhaps a new AP-1000, which means that when the CEO of Westinghouse was telling Bloomberg last year that there are some utilities in America that are interested in another one, though he couldn't name them, he might have been talking about, I think, Dominion that owns Millstone out there, um, that uh, isn't a full reactor set and could afford a new one. Helpfully in Connecticut as well, they're teaming up with some of the other New England states because the New England states are starting to realize that the market, the New England ISO, isn't conducive 
to them hitting their climate targets and maintaining reliability at the same time. They're very frustrated by that. And they don't want to have to keep going to Connecticut taxpayers to say, hey, we need to use some of your money to buy from this nuclear plant at a, re- at a reasonable rate so that it stays online because we just need it, okay? So yeah, we have a lot of dynamics that are pointing towards nuclear. It's going to be like, a, it's going to be a total goat rodeo. It's going to be really hard to wrangle and it's going to require a huge level of consensus. The American system is built to basically at the national level only do what absolutely almost everyone either doesn't care about agreeing on <laughs> or does actually agree on. Yeah. You know, so things where people are really divided and care a lot about it, lots of inertia. Things where people don't care for and policy is a great example. People can kind of do whatever they want and then America falls into whatever habits it falls into there. Other stuff requires a great level of unanimity and that is by design. That is how it is supposed to work. So we're going to have to get there and I think it's going to be a very painful road there. We're going to have to basically be dragged kicking and screaming into a more nuclear future. I'd like you to paint for us what the grid looks like without major policy change and intervention. We're, we're going to have coal plants shutting down. Gas will be relatively cheap. Gas plants will be relatively quick to build and cheap to build. Um, lots more wind and solar, I guess. What does that start to, I mean, am I correct in that assumption? Um, you know, and what does that start to do to the grid? Um, you know, gas is gas is pretty awesome, but it, it has its limitations. You mentioned that uh, under pressurization issue in, in New York, Meredith Angwin's talked about, you know, do you heat or <laughs> or uh, or make juice, make electricity? Um, these these concerns come up. So, I mean, just, uh, you know, my listenership's pretty well educated on this, but I'd like to really deep dive, you know, what are the problems with becoming over-reliant on gas? And again, if you could just paint that picture for us of without policy intervention, without interventions like your book, which will hopefully be read by a lot of uh, uh, thinkers and think tanks and policymakers, inshallah, um, you know, what, what, what we're heading towards. Right. So I, I want to direct people to um, Travis Fisher. He's over at Cato. He wrote a piece. I published it on Grid Brief, and he also published it in his Substack, the, um, the Fish Tank. And he wrote a really great piece on what happens if these RTOs basically become clearinghouses for subsidies. And he agrees with former FERC commissioner, uh, James Danley, that it will basically tell people, the price signal will tell people that it is uh, free or better to build wind and solar. So we're going to get way more of that. The subsidies will hasten the exit of this base load power. And like you said, I think we're going to get a proliferation of gas. So you mentioned the pressurization issue. Gas contracts... In ISO New England, on the pipeline system, work in a way that the heating and and those utilities, because of their structure, can basically pay for access all the time, right? That's what they're interested in, or or at least seasonally. It is not wise for a natural gas plant operator to sign one of those contracts if they're going to be bidding into a market and they don't know how it's going to go. So they have these more ad hoc contracts for pipeline access. If you shunt more things on to these natural gas generators that don't have guarantees that they'll be served first in a time of crisis, I think we see another element of fragility that's going to happen here, especially as New England and especially New York, New York's ISO just put out a report about this, I think two days ago or yesterday, actually, saying that they are now moving from a summer peaking system to a winter peaking system, right? So that's going to be a new challenge avenue there. The other thing that I will say is that we are going to be, uh, we would be very sensitive to price swings in the natural gas market because of that. So we'll see perhaps all sorts of random spikes, even at times of very mild load. Um, I think we saw some of that in California, if I remember correctly, some of the locational marginal pricing that was coming out of Kaiso in January as the Arctic blast fell on its northern neighbors uh, were pretty intense. And at sometimes I think nearing $1,000 a megawatt hour, which was pretty crazy. 
And these were days where California had like very little else going on on its grid. So we might see things like that. I actually think that we are going to start seeing major challenges to getting more wind and solar on the grid. I think the story of winds, vi- offshore winds viability are becoming clear to everyone, even people in the wind industry. And they're at least saying like, this won't be cheap anymore. You know, so we're getting a little bit of candor from Siemens Gamisa and others about that. And I just, uh, I think it's going to be very hard to finance those. So I don't think we're going to see a lot of that going forward. Onshore wind, I know less about, so I'm not going to speak too heavily on that. But I think we're all familiar with the cannibalization problems of solar, where if you get enough of it, it's all producing at the same time. And then it devalues, there's a supply glut and it devalues itself. And so there's less incentive to build it. People expect batteries to fix that. You know, I where that we might be able to see batteries do some shaving. And I think they can do some sh- helpful shaving. I think batteries are a useful technology for the grid no matter what. Whether or not you're doing like wind, water, solar, or whatever, I think, you know, batteries should be in the mix. So I, I, I want to be like a pro energy mix person there. Um, but I think we'll see the limitations of that in ERCOT where there is a lot of uh, – battery capacity being added right now. I think the last time I looked at that, there was just a ton coming on. I think S&P Global should be releasing their seasonal report on it at the end of the quarter. But, uh, you know, I think what we're going to see is that uh, everybody is starting to not get what they want. We're going to see power prices go up. We might see, I think we'll definitely see an increase in fragility. And, you know, next year is when we're supposed to see the Biden era subsidies go in. So we don't even know how crazy this is going to get is the other thing I want to add. We don't yet know how nutso this can really become. FERC Order 888, which was you know pushing us towards these markets, was supposed to achieve reliability at least cost. We are now pursuing neither of those things. <laughs> Unreliability at peak cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. You know, so I, I, I and it's clear, uh, you know, that the market frameworks, the way they work now, aren't the best. It's difficult to say what could be better. I know that most engineers hate power markets and most economists like them. The story of the grid is that neither economists nor engineers get everything they want and never have when it comes to the economics of electricity. So I think you know we're going to have uh, these interesting debates. I told Robert when I was on his show a while ago that uh, we're at the beginning of this. You know, we're at the beginning of this problem. We are. This is not. We're not in the part of this moment in history where we're in the active problem solving stage. We're in the problem identification problem stage. making stage, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, those are sort of coinciding, right? So, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that's been surprising to me is some of the people from NERC, again, the North American Electricity Reliability Corp, have been going on some podcasts and, you know, NERC's a policy taker, not a policy maker. I think I'm glad that, uh, you know, sometimes it's frustrating to me that they aren't more critical of policy, but then I remember they would be less useful if they were, and they would be seen as more partisan, and I don't really want that from them. But they've been very clear. They're like, look, batteries is, batteries aren't generation, and people need to stop thinking that. Like, there are just fundamental realities to this system, and we need to get acquainted with those. They put out a report uh, last spring, I think it was, where they said the biggest threat to reliability on the grid is our current energy policy. And then the second, the second greatest threat was the grid transformations that that energy policy was uh, incurring, I believe. So one and two were kind of the same thing. Um, and that to me tells me that there are serious people whose Incentives line up with maintenance of the system who do take this seriously, who aren't partisan ideologues, and who want to get this right. And you know what? I want to give credit to the now chairman, thankfully. He's not just acting chairman, Willie Phillips um, in FERC. Even he and Allison Clements, who's about to step off from FERC, told the Senate last May that we need to keep coal on. And Clements and Phillips are Democrats who are very concerned with environmental justice and climate change, but even they recognize the importance of the reliability of the system. So I think there is potential 
for reasonable conversation for motivated and interested parties here. I don't want this to turn strictly into partisan infighting, not just because I personally am sick of that, but because of the level of broad consensus we need for any of these solutions to go forward. I will add this. If anyone in America thinks we are going to get to a point in at least my lifetime where we are not figuring out how to put wind and solar on the grid, wake up. The interest for that is not going away anytime soon. That's just the way it is. That's We're just going to be trying to do that. Now, I might disagree with that, but it's going to be what's happening. And a lot of how this is going to get decided is the po- is politics, and politics is the art of the possible. You know, it, it is, you're saying the subsidy is, uh, subsidy monsoons are not coming until next year. And, uh, you know, I'm no economist, but, uh, it seems like the cost of energy is a, is a key driver of inflation. If it, if energy prices go up, then everything gets expensive. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see if the inflation reduction act lives up to its, its, uh, its title. Um, you know, just, I guess in closing, um, you know, talking about these retirements of fossil fuel facilities, um, you know, more renewables going on the grid, producing unreliable, unreliably. I mean, I think we're really looking at electricity shortages. And, you know, when that's acute, that's a blackout or brownout. When it's chronic, I'm not exactly sure what we call it or what it looks like, if it just means higher prices to incent consumers not to use electricity. Um, but again, with these gigawatt electric scale, um, uh, you know, data centers going online. Sam Altman was quoted recently as saying, you know, we need a energy breakthrough or energy revolution um, in order to enable, you know, this AI future that is rapidly being built. Again, you get a Google search using AI is 10 to 20 times more electricity than just a traditional Google search. And that's just, the, that's not the porn. That's just the Google search. Um, you know, and, and of course, as a tech bro, he says it's probably going to be fusion, um, you know, or I guess advanced nuclear is in there as well. I think it's fascinating. Um, you know, I've, I've been speaking with a few tech bros recently, and I, I, I'm being pejorative. I shouldn't, um, but uh, you know, there seems to be this fascination with um, maybe it's a bit like libertarian, but you know, the server farm should have like a little micro reactor on it, and that's kind of the way to solve this issue. Just kind of to be sort of self contained and take care of itself, rather than going, "Holy shit, we're going to need a lot more generation." Um, like we're building gigawatt scale servers. Maybe we need gigawatt scale reactors. And I'm not suggesting they build a reactor to just, you know, provide power to their own facility, but this might lead to a conversation that's more broad around planning uh, within these different uh, RTOs or, or utility service areas for, Hey, you know, we have a baseload need now baseloads back, baby baseload sexy um, <laughs> data centers are baseload. Um, we might just need to build some, you know, clean baseload generators. So I'm not sure, um, you know, there's another famous key for rambling, question slash commentary, but no, I can. So yeah, let me respond to that a little bit. So, um, I used to think that that was just this sort of arch libertarian response. I don't think that anymore. One of the things that we forget is that most manufacturers or whatever had their own behind the meter power plants for a really long time for the first like 30 years of the electric era. And it was only in America, world war one that changed that. Coal shortages created huge rationing that made their individual services uneconomic, which had allowed Samuel Insull and his utilities to cross the moat and to bring them into his utility empire. And it took a long time to get there. People don't want to give up on their power sources. So what we might be seeing is a reversion to how behind the meter services that were the original paradigm of how this worked for large demand facilities. Now, that's going to run into the problem of whether or not we can even do micro reactors or what have you, right? So it's a little bit different in, in that terms, like people already had scalable size coal plants in the offing, you know, that had different economies of scale. <clears throat> So when I take a look at this, I don't necessarily see it as this arch libertarian reaction, but really um, what seems to be a typical business response to the utility framework as it existed the entire time it has. There has always been a fraught relationship between these places that need a lot of power all all the time and the utilities that provide that. It's not harmonious and it hasn't been. You know, some of the people who were buying a ton of wholesale power that wanted power markets because they thought we were going to get a better deal were like manufacturing trade organizations in the 90s. 
because they didn't want to get hosed by the stupid incentives that run monopoly utilities in America. I mean, there's this great quote from a guy in the 50s that said, the utility industry is the only one I know of where you can turn a profit by redecorating your office. You know, so I mean, look, I don't, I think it's very easy to say like, these guys don't know what they're talking about or, and maybe they don't, but what they're identifying is something that has always been a tension within the electricity system in America. And I almost think it's less helpful to see it in ideological terms than to see it in almost like even dumber, just interest political economy terms of what they're looking at when they say that. They take a look at the power markets and say, this looks screwy. They take a look at utilities and say, I don't want to be beholden to that. Is there an alternative where I have more control over my balance book at the end of the day? What firm is going to say they don't want that? Yeah, fair play. Emmett, we're going to have to cut it somewhere, and I think that somewhere is here. Um, just over an hour, uh, but it's it's phenomenal having you back. It's been way too long since we've had the chance to interact, and what a joy it is to have a podcast, to be able to make an excuse to hang out with someone for an hour, especially someone I respect <laughs> as much as you, my friend. Um, looking forward to that book. Do you have a working title? Yeah. I mean, I so I'm not going to share the title or anything right now. I've yet to sign a contract with anybody. I don't want to do By the way, if you work for Simon & Schuster or something, hit me up. Um, you know, but uh, I'm already moving ahead on writing it because I want to stop thinking about it. That's basically why I write. If anybody wants to know like what drives some writers, for me, it's because I want to stop staying up thinking about something. So I need to write about it. And then as soon as I write it, I almost completely forget it. Right, right. I love it. Purge it. Um, okay, Emmett. Take another swig from that monstrously large uh, drinking yeah. beverage of you, that horn of, uh, I don't know, some uh, massive prehistoric horned beast, you barbarian you. Okay, we'll talk again soon. That's right. <laughs> Bye for now. Catch you later, bud.